Hey Collabers, I'm Ben Leroy. And I'm Jason Buckholtz. And you're listening to Collabracast. How you doing, Jay? I'm all right. Where are you? That's not your usual background. I'm in Chicago. I'm, um, uh, you and I talked, uh, first off, my apologies to anyone who's listening to this because the audio is probably going to sound terrible because I don't have a microphone. Jason will still sound like Casey Kasem over here. It'll be clear, <laughs> it'll be good, but I'm going to probably sound like garbage. You got uh, some good reverb going. It, it, yeah. It sounds like you're, yeah. you're stuck at the bottom of the well. <laughs> <laughs> in Maybe Chicago, Jessica. the bottom of the Chicago well. I am I'm on the lovely and um, very academically distinguished campus of the University of Chicago. And back in late 2022, I started an organization called the Harold Heights Initiative. And our mission was to do something very similar to what Collaborus is doing. We're using story, narrative therapy, and other adjacent things to help people tell their stories, but especially organizations. And so right now, tomorrow, I'll be presenting with some other people. There are about 100 nonprofits from the south side of Chicago that are participating in this. And my Harold Heights colleagues and myself are going to be working with nonprofits to help them easily identify what their story is, how to tell their story in a way to get community engagement and community involvement. So it's a lot about figuring out the personal story of the people who are involved. Why are you doing this thing or how are you called to do this kind of work? And then what was it like to get a nonprofit? But then also, how do you ask for help in the community, whether it be for volunteers, resources, money, whatever. So this is a really cool event. I have long held the University of Chicago in very high regard as one of the world's premier academic institutions. And to be here and to be around a lot of people who are trying to do good in the world and be able to play even a small role and helping people develop their stories is, is really cool. And just because I don't want to break the trend, it's a little bit overcast. It's uh, I can see some buildings and there's a little bit of gray sky. It's very dramatic. I'm kind of doing that. So I am recording here in a hotel room and trying to get the light and the audio okay. Um, how about you? You're also in some new digs, it looks like. I'm in my shed and my the wind is catching the door and making it creak. So give me one second to deal okay. with that. I'll entertain the people while you do that. Thank you for your patience. Oh, look, there's a motorcycle going by. So that's kind of loud. That's that's good. Spiller. It's, it's a little bit of excitement. It raises the drama and tension. Uh, I will also let people know. This is going to probably be a pretty short episode. We wanted to make sure that we did not get out of the habit and routine of a weekly episode, but for all parties, audience and hosts, this will probably be a shorter endeavor. What's your weather doing? We could do it. We could do a 20 minute preamble to (laughs) stretch it out. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I'm in my shed. My kids are bouncing around in the house listening to their music and their videos and their their techno things Uh, what are they listening to these days what did the kids listen to um hazel likes watching a variety of videos um she likes watching people build things out of legos she's been asking a lot of questions about the origins of the universe and and life so awesome. she's got some video, you know, like five-year-olds do. Uh, Hawthorne likes, he's much more likely to like a song if it's not in English. He has a, a playlist that has, uh, well, it's got the, I think the, one of the more recent editions was the Ukrainian national anthem. Um, but he's got German songs, Chinese songs. All sorts of things. It's it, this guy has been introducing me to quite a variety of things. 
Speaking speaking of the Ukrainian music, have you listened to Daka Braka lately? Um, not 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 in the last few months, probably. But um, yeah, that's good stuff. I'm a fan. Yeah, you yeah, introduced fan. me to them. Absent any larger itinerary, we did get a question. We've, we've spent a few weeks here talking about agents and the submission process and querying. And we did get somebody who asked, how do you find the agents to reach out to? And there are a couple of answers to that. But I thought, why don't we start with what Jason Buckholz's experience was in finding an agent? I have snuck in the back door of the agenting world twice, basically. <laughs> the first time uh, was a good, well, we've told this story before. Our, our mutual dear friend, Robin Russell, who was a, a close friend and an editor of mine, became an agent and represented my first book. Um, she ceased agenting you ceased publishing. So I had to, I had to recreate that whole pipeline. Um, Wendy Levinson was a friend of a friend. Um, I was introduced to her by our mutual acquaintance, Nikki Vandekar, um, who is a wonderful author and editor in who lives in the town of volcano Hawaii, which I just love. Um, but she knew Wendy and knew I was looking for an agent and introduced us. And then I, I submitted my things to Wendy and um, it was, it was a go. Fortunately, um, that's both of those circumstances are luxuries that, that few people will be offered. And, and somehow I struck gold twice. So I think, I think I used up all my luck for the rest of my, <laughs> well, we'll see. I need, I need just a little more, but um, yeah, don't, don't, don't use my story as a framework for, well, Hey, if you have friends of friends that are agents, go, go for it. <laughs> well, don't go stalk people who have agent friends. Cause that's, that's not the way to do it. I'm, I'm going to ask a question here assuming I know the answer, or maybe I don't. Even as someone who has already published a book, even somebody who has a foot in a door, were you still nervous? Did you still have butterflies when you reached out to Wendy? Oh, definitely. Um, e even, you know, despite my earlier experiences, <laughs> I still knew that it was, there was no guarantee of anything um her being of i've i since then i've introduced wendy to somebody who i think is a wonderful writer and um and she declined her work so there isn't it, it, it you know i don't there are no there are no shortcuts there are it, it, sometimes you can find an introduction somewhere and a lot of people come across agents at writers conferences and things like that sometimes you can do a little something to get just just a half step above the slush pile but that's it you get you get maybe just that one priority look but at that point the work has to stand on its own merit you're not it's going to be a, a polite no thank you unless it's truly a uh, yes, please. Let's take a look at this. That's an important. Um, I just I was going to say that's an important thing. Is there are times when people talk about that this business is not what you do, but who you know, and maybe to an extent that holds true in some cases. But really, it will always come down to the work because an agent doesn't get paid unless they sell a book. So doing favors to say, oh yeah, I'll represent you. If it's not going to result in a book being sold or money being made, then an agent's not gonna do it just to extend a personal courtesy to a friend or an acquaintance. Exactly. And she's put a lot of time and energy and effort into it. And it, it's 
you know, and this is still a book that I'm working to wrap up. So it hasn't generated her a dime yet. So this is, you know, the, she's not going to put that effort into it unless she believes that it's, it's, it's worth her, you know, valuable time. So, um, yeah, I was, I was nervous, but I'd done a lot of work and I, you know, you get to that point where you send it out and you, you know that you've done your homework and you just cross your fingers and, and I got lucky. Um, had I not though, there are a couple of other approaches that people take to get to this point. And I was thinking about this today and, and it's a little bit, if to, to use an overworked metaphor, the needle in the haystack, there's, there's one way of doing it where you kind of pick out each straw and then look at it and see if it's a needle. And then the other way is going is kind of reverse engineering the process and then going in and finding the needle. Um, so that's, that way would be finding titles that are comparable to your own, finding books that you think cover similar themes, similar topics, are aimed at a similar audience, contemporary books, things that have, again, just within the last two, three years, um, finding those titles and then finding out who represented them. And the way that you do that is by most often by checking the author's contact me page. Most authors are going to have a website. Somewhere on that website, it's going to say there's going to be contacts. Uh, you're not likely to get someone's personal email address at that point. More, more likely is there's going to be an email to, to their agent. Um, there might be multiple agents. If they're in multiple markets, there could be people who are representing different rights who uh, who have different legal who are representatives of the author in different legal capacities but the best way to do it was is to look for who who's representing them and then that tells you um, that tells you where that needle is the other way is you can just go and look up agencies using your favorite internet search engine and you'll there are dozens and dozens of agencies and you can go through and each agent has their bio. And that's the way that's kind of like picking up each straw and then looking to see if it's a needle, but you can go through kind of the manual way of, of searching through the tons and tons of agent bios on their websites. And then it'll say what they're interested in. It'll say what they like. It'll say what they're looking for. It'll, you know, and you can do dig a little deeper and see who they've represented and see if they have any titles that they've represented that are resonant with yours. One of the important things that comes up is being familiar with the genre that you're hoping to, to be a part of. And I have definitely met authors who do a lot of writing and don't do a lot of reading. I'm, I'm guilty of that sometimes just because so much of what I'm reading is stuff that hasn't been published yet. And I'm not as well versed in what is coming out, what's on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm, I'm inadequately prepared to have those discussions. And every time someone's like, oh, have you read the new? Usually I meet them with a the blank stare and apologize that no, I have not yet. But so it is No, important. but I've read these five manuscripts and I'm the only person who's read right. them. Exactly. <laughs> It is important to be familiar with who is getting published in the genre, how books are doing, how well they're doing, and being aware of that. And then from there, like Jason said, you can often find agent contact information on an author's website. They'll say for literary inquiries, reach out to so-and-so. The other place that you can find that is in the acknowledgments page of a book, if there's an acknowledgment page, authors will often thank their agent. And, sure should. Yeah, which, yeah, which you should. Mm -hmm. There are also a variety of ways to do research about agents and agencies in general, because not all agents and not all agencies are created equal. There are a lot of people who, because there is no barrier to entry, you could raise, you could put out a shingle right now and say that you are an agent. No one can really stop you from doing yeah. that, but you wouldn't be prepared for it because a lot of people do that. And some are 
well-intentioned, but unaware of how the industry works. Some are people who, as we've talked about in earlier episodes, and engage in fraudulent practices where maybe they're going to ask you to pay them. And that's not something that you should do. I personally frequently comb through Reddit because there are a lot of discussions about agents and agencies. And so if I see something, or I've had experience with a particular agent or an agency, I'll chime in. Uh, there used to be a very popular website called Absolute Right that did uh, would have a thread for the different agencies and different publishers so that people can see real world experience with these people. And, you know, I'm very happy with his agent or this agent is slow to act, but has also been very successful because there is if not an expectation, there's a hope that correspondence with an agent is going to be fast and swift. And it's going to be like, hey, here's what my book is about. And they're going to write back an hour later, like send it to me. And then you send it to them and then you go get dinner. And then you're hoping you start refreshing your inbox. Like, oh, is this person going to already have responded and told me how much they love my book? And it can get frustrating waiting for a response if it feels like it's taking forever and uh, that may be something where people say well this person isn't really communicating or communicating slowly but then that same agent will have just done two or three major deals and that's that's really where the rubber meets the road is like are they making a deal are they getting something done so there are a variety of places if you are a listener and you have a particular agent that you have a question about or you want to know something about, you're welcome to send an email to info at collaborist.org. And if it's someone that I can talk about or we can bring on the podcast to talk about a certain thing, like we'd love to do that. We, I've got a pretty healthy Rolodex of agents and other publishers. So that's out there. You mentioned slow response times sometimes and an agent who maybe has just done a couple of deals. Those deals get announced broadly through the industry. So if there is somebody who is really tearing it up out there, someone's so hot right now, like Hansel, um, then they're going to be getting all kinds of inquiries. They're going to be, they are going to have flooded inboxes and it is going to take them longer to get back to you. So the, the caveat the caveat that I would say there too is that you might see that an agent is doing lots of deals, multiple deals, so many deals that makes your head spin. It's important to evaluate where are those deals getting done because there are agents who are doing a lot of deals, but if they're doing them with publishers who don't pay in advance or have low royalty rates, or don't have distribution, the deals are done, but they're not indicative of this is positioning you for the success that you want as an author. Okay. If you guys are listening to the podcast and not watching, that might have been an awkward silence, but if you were watching, that's probably pretty hilarious. <laughs> was a... a... <laughs> I think we might have uh, might have covered the topic. Yeah. Anything else that you'd like to add? No. From the shed? Aside from my completely useless, non-illustrative examples from my own personal life. <laughs> I've got, I'm full of things that you shouldn't, I'm full of historical stories of things you shouldn't do. Uh, those are just two of the many. But, yeah, um, and but and they're out there. Have- and, and they're looking, you know, they're looking for, you know, they are, if, if you listened to my interview with Wendy a couple of weeks ago, she spends a good chunk of her day just reading things, looking for voices, looking, looking for work. This is something that they are, it's, it, it can be intimidating because the, it, it's difficult. It's a big kind of filter in the whole publishing process. This is, it's a, it's a bottleneck of, of those who want agents and those who actually are able to 
to get them. But it's been my experience with everyone I've come across that they're very invested in what they're doing. They're very respectful. They're very, I mean, my, my experience, I'm speaking my own experiences. I'm sure that there are exceptions out there, but, but they are, they are passionate about finding good writing. And if you have some to share, then they're going to come to you. All right. Well, I don't have anything to add. So let's call it an episode. Thank you for bearing with us while we're filming from secret secondary locations. Weird places. (laughs) If you enjoy this podcast, not just today's episode, but if you're one of our longtime listeners, please remember to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm still, I don't mean to guilt trip you people. But I still, every morning I wake up and I'm all bleary eyed and I'm like, oh, is today the day that I open up the Apple podcast app and I see that somebody left us a review? (laughs) I see all the stars, but I really would like some judgment. So you could be the first person who does that. And I will knock like $11 off any service um, that we can provide if you do that. Other than that, follow us on the social media. We do have conversations going there. And if you are listening to this podcast, please know that you can watch it. You can see the magic happen on YouTube. You can see our shed in our hotel room. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So let's hit the let's hit the words. The outro for story for community. Collaborists. Buy from the hotel. Buy from the shed.